So in this tutorial, I want to talk to you about the common test for uh, analyzing categorical variables. So we have nominal and we have ordinal categorical variables where we have a sample space of very defined elements. We could perhaps extend this a little bit into the world of discrete numerical variables if we're only interested in how many of them occurred and not the actual values themselves. So let's just stick to categorical variables. We have categorical variables. We have a sample space of these defined values and we want to analyze them. Statistical test for categorical variables. Now I want to talk to you about the three most common ones and we're going to use the R programming language as is the norm for this playlist. And I'm going to talk to you about those three common ones. So first of all, there's going to be the chi-squared test of goodness of fit. So that's when we're going to have a single variable and we're going to have these elements in the sample space and we're going to count how many each of them occur in a study that we do and we're going to see if that proportion, how many of each someone chose or how many of each there are, is that different from what we would expect there to have happened. And then we're going to have the chi-squared test of independence. That's where we're going to compare two categorical variables against each other and the question that we're asking is the outcome of one dependent on the outcome of the other. So if we count the number of elements in the one versus those same elements in the other and we compare those against each other, is there a difference in or is there a dependence between those, those two categorical variables? And then lastly, you'll also come across Fisher's exact test. Now that exact word in there, that doesn't mean it's a better test. We use it when we have very small sample sizes. So if we look at those values and many of them are less than five uh, subjects in each of those values, then we're going to use the Fisher's exact test and the exact comes from the fact that we calculate the p-value exactly or directly. In other words, we're not going to first calculate a statistic, a test statistic, and then see where it falls on some distribution curve and work out the area under the curve. No, no, we're going to calculate the p-value directly and that makes it an exact test. So let's have a look at these. It's the chi-squared test of goodness of fit for a single variable and then the chi-squared test for independence or the Fisher's exact test where we compare two categorical variables against each other. Let's have a look. So here we go looking at the test for categorical variables. Now what we see here is the rendered HTML file on our pubs. Remember that the RMD file, the R Studio file will be available on GitHub for you to download and of course you can just view this file as we have here on our pub. So let's just go through that. I'm going to talk about the chi-square goodness of fit test and the chi-square test of independence and then also the Fisher's exact test. So those would be the most common tests that we'll see for categorical variables. Now you would notice there the two types, goodness of fit and test for independence. The way that I want to explain it here, the goodness of fit test, is that we're really just going to look at a single variable. And for that single variable, we'll have a sample space and we'll count the number of occurrences uh, of each of the unique values in the sample space when we collect this data for a variable. So imagine that we were to roll a fair die 1,200 times. Now, uh, a normal die has six sided, six sided, so there's six faces. And if it's a fair die, we would expect that every face would land up about 200 times. So it's a single variable, you know, the, the, the variable is the face that lands face up, the number that lands face up, and we're just counting how many of each of these occurs, occur. Whereas the test for independence, that is where we're going to look at two categorical variables and we're going to see if there's some dependence between the two, the null hypothesis being there's no dependence between the two. So we're really looking at proportions here of sample space values for categorical variables. So let's just start off with the chi-square test of independence. So uh, the chi-square goodness of, uh, of fit test, I should say. So let's consider a very simple example. We're going to take a hundred samples from a population and we are going to ask them a question in a survey and they can choose one of four options. Strongly disagree with a statement we might make. Disagree, agree or strongly agree. So there's only four to choose from. 
And let's just say for argument's sake, we expect an equal distribution of those four answers. We don't expect that people will choose one over the other. So our expected distribution is just 25 each. So if we give it to 100 people, we expect 25 to choose strongly disagree, 25 will disagree, 25 will agree, and 25 will strongly agree. And now we get back 10, 30, 35, and 25 for each of those. So this is an example of a multinomial categorical variable. There are more than two. The sample space has more than two. If there were just two, yes or no, for instance, that would be binomial. But this is indeed multinomial. There are four elements in the sample space of this question variable. And so let's assume that 10 people chose strongly disagree, 30 disagree, 35 agreed, and 25 strongly agreed. So if we mark each of our, if you see down here, we mark each of our observed values of uppercase y sub i, we'll have that y sub 1 is 10, y sub 2 is 30, y sub 3 is 35, and y sub 4 is 25. So there's a total of 100, so n equals 100 subjects. And the probabilities that we expected, if we could write that here as uh, lowercase p subscript i, p1 will be 0.25, and so on until p4, we expect that. And then the general form that these types of tests take is, is that we sum up the square of the differences between the observed and the expected values, and we divide that by the expected. So that difference, again, is going to always be positive because we square it, and then we divide by how many is expected. So if we just look at the single variable, what would be the observed? Well, that would be all of the yi's, so the 10, the 30, the 35, and the 25. What do we expect? Well, just think about it. If we expect a quarter of people to choose, and there's 100 people, so it'll be the 100 people times a quarter. So that's where we get the n times pi. So there was 10 and a quarter of uh, 125, so there's going to be 10 minus, uh, 10 minus uh, 25 for the first one. We square that difference to make it positive, and we divide it by the 25. And we add up all of these differences, um, and lo and behold, we get a chi-square value. So, let's just do that inside of code, the long way. So, we're going to create a computer variable here. We're going to call it just y, and we attach to that this vector of values. So, we use the c function, the 10, the 30, the 35, and the 25. That's our observed count. Now, the probabilities. We're going to create a, a vector called p there, and we'll use the rep function because we're going to repeat 0.25 four times. So it's just going to be a vector of 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0.25. And the sum, we're just summing up all of these, the 10, the 30, the 35, and the 25, and that's going to get to 100. So let's work out the chi-square value. So we're going to sum all of these things. So it's going to be y minus n times p squared divided by n times p. And because all these vectors are of equal length, it's going to be no problem. We're going to have this broadcasting where it's going to be element by element, at least. And we're going to get back a chi-square value of 14. Now, this chi-square value follows a chi-square sampling distribution. And you would remember from chi-square sampling distributions, you might know, you might remember that these look different depending on the degrees of freedom. So we've got to work that out, and that's simple enough. And as much as the degrees of freedom that we have here is how many values there were in the sample space. There were four minus how many variables were there. Well, there was just one in this instance, so we have three degrees of freedom. So we, we're going to create that as a little computer variable, df, which is just going to hold the value three. And then we can use the uh, probability chi-squared test to work out a p-value for us. And the first argument is going to be our chi-squared value of 14. The second is going to be the degrees of freedom. And the last one, we say lower, lower tail equals false, because what we want is the area under the curve from the value 14 towards positive infinity. And that gives us a p-value of 0 0.002. So they, that, this, we can say that the proportion that we found, the 10, the 30, the 35, and the 25, having expected an equal distribution of those, a uniform distribution, I should say, uh, is statistically significant. Our value was a, a rare value to find. Now, we don't have to do any of that. We can just use the chi-square.test, so it's chisq.test, and we just pass the vector values and the p, the probability. Remember, that's going to be 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. That's the whole vector. And we get nicely back a chi-square test for the given probabilities. We get a chi-square value of 14, degrees of freedom of 3, as we expected, and the same p-value.
So simple enough if you ever have that situation where you just have the single variable and they are categorical or discrete numerical as well. Remember, if, if, if we can just look discreetly at each individual value or then uh, more notably a categorical variable and we have that defined sample space, we just count the proportions. Now, as I mentioned, the chi-square test of independence, that's a bit difficult. We're going to compare the, the proportions at least of two categorical variables against each other. So, as always, let's just look at an example. It makes life very easy. And we are going to have a categorical variable called group. And the sample space is going to contain two elements, group 1 and group 2. So, imagine a group of uh, patients. They fall either into group 1 or group 2. You can imagine that they get different types of medication, a placebo and an experimental drug, for instance. And for some variable, we're going to call it outcome. Uh, that outcome variable is also nominal categorical and it contains an sample space of three elements, worse, same, and improve. So we just decided this patient got worse, this one got the same, and, and that one improved. And you can see the values that we have there. The total values, 44 worse than 72 stayed the same, and 55 improved. So when we break this down, we see the 33 subjects in group 1 improving, 44 staying the same, and 25 improving, and we have 11, 28, and 30 for group 2 for those numbers. So how would we represent that? Well, we do that in what is called a contingency table, a little matrix. So one way that we can uh, do this is just to have two vectors and uh, we just row bind them. So each of the vectors will now form a row. And I'm going to store that in the computer variable OBS. OBS. So I'm going to R bind my 33, 44 and 25, my 11, my 28, my 30. And just for the sake of argument, as you can see nicely printed out below here, I'm going to put these column names and row names in there. So I'm going to say row names obs, and I'm going to pass the string vector, group 1 and group 2 to it, and the col name is going to be worse, same, and improved. So when we print this obs out, it looks very nice because we can immediately see in group 1 there were 33 that got worse, 44 that stayed the same, 25 that improved, 11 in group 2 that got worse, 28 were the same, and 30 uh, improved. Now we want to ask, the question, was the outcome of the patient, was that outcome dependent on which group they were in? That's the question we're asking. But you can see both are nominal categorical variables that we want to compare to each other. So that's our table of observations, our observed contingency table. Two rows, three columns, two by three. You can have three by three, four by three. doesn't matter the size that we have. So you can have more elements in each of your categorical variables. Now we need to work out an, ob uh, an expected table. And we, we really, if, if you read down here, it says, let's start with the number of expected subjects in group 1 that worsened. The observed count was 33. Now given that there were 44 subjects who worsened, so if I count up this column, 33 and 11, that gives me 44, so not that 44. 44 worsened, and there were... Um, uh, who worsened and 102 subjects in group 1. So if I just look at group 1 and I add 33, 44, and 25, I get 102. So if 44 worsened, worsened overall, but group 1 only contained 102, I can work out what I expected this 33 to be by very easily multiplying this column total times this row total, and I divide that by the sum total. There were 171 patients in this whole uh, group. So that's 44 times 102 divided by 171. That gives me 26.2. So we would expect, given that there were 44 people who worsened, and that there were 102 people in group 1, out of a sum total of 171, we would expect, with those proportions, there to have been 26.2 people. It's going to be a fraction, in place of the 33. And you can work out all six values. It's the column total times the row total in which that value appears divided by the sum total. And if you do all of that, you're going to have these six values in what is called an expected table. Now, we don't have to do all of that. This is R for statistical programming. So we can just use the chi squared dot test function. We pass our observed table. Now, we don't have to put these row and column names in there like I did. All you need is this, this matrix of values. And we say correct equals false. I'm not going to get into that. We don't want Yates' correction. Yates' correction there. 
and that gives us a, a Pearson chi squared test and we see a chi-squared value of 8.976 degrees of freedom of 2 and a p-value of 0.01. So that is smaller if we choose an alpha value of 0.05, that's smaller. So we definitely say that your outcome was dependent upon which group you were in. And now you can start looking at uh, different uh, percentages you might express just to see you know, which group, if you just look at improve or just look at worsened, you can sort of express in words what this table is trying to tell us. But definitely there is dependence on these two. Now also note I could have trans uh, transposed this. I could have worse same and improve on my rows and groups on my right. Uh, uh, I should say on the columns, group 1 and group 2. So I would have three rows and two columns. That makes no difference at all. And it also doesn't really make a difference in which way you explain it. You could say... Um, the group that you were in were dependent upon whether you got worse, you stayed the same, or you improved. We just attach some human meaning to it by say, suggesting that your outcome is going to be dependent on which group you were in. So I'm oversimplifying there slightly, but I think uh, that explains the situation. Now the last test I just want to talk about is just Fisher's exact test. It has the word exact in there. And, um, it might sound like it's a, you know, a, of higher quality in some way, a better test, but it is not. Exact just means we are calculating a p-value directly. We are not first calculating a, a test statistic, like a t-statistic or a chi-square statistic, statistic that falls on some distribution curve and then we work out the area under the curve. That's not what we do in exact test. In exact test, we just have an equation and we calculate it and there's a p-value. And that's what the exact means. It doesn't mean it's any more exact or any better than in any other test. So let's look at Fisher's exact test. Now, the, these chi-square values, they fall on this curve, this chi-square distribution curve, but when the numbers start getting small, like you only have less than, say, five uh, subjects in each of these, in each of these, or at least 80% of these, you have values of less than five. So if that was four and three and one, it's not going to follow that chi distribution curve very nicely. When the numbers get small, things go a little haywire. And in those cases, we can use Fisher's exact test. Now, Fisher's exact tests are going to work for these large numbers, but we use what is called a factorial calculation. And a factorial is very easy. If I say 5 factorial, it means I go from 5 and I count back and I multiply. So 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So 2 factorial is 2 times 1, which is just 2. 3 factorial is 6 because it's 3 times 2 times 1. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 is 24. And then 25, and by the time you get to 10, you're talking about very big numbers. It really ramps up quite a bit. So 44, or, you know, the, you're going to get to a number very quickly that is out of limits of what your computer can actually calculate. So don't overuse the Fisher's exact test just because there's an exact in it. Use it where it's proper, and that's where we have very small values. And there's the equation for it. Now, it also uses a contingency table, but in this simple form, you, only, you can only have four values in your contingency table. So it's one categorical variable against the, another, but the sample space of both of those can only be two. So in this instance, we have a... Uh, two row by three column, we can't have that, we can only have two by two. So what you would have to do is by some logical argument, because you're an expert in what you are researching, you would have to combine two of these. So I might put uh, same and improved as one and, and add this 44 and 25 and add the 28 and 30 and make that just worse and not worse. Or we could have the worse and same together and saying not improved and improved so that you have these two by two, and if you had more than two groups, you would also have to combine them in some way. And then we're going to have the fact that from the top left to the bottom right, we're going to have, if we just look at this one, we'll have A, B, C, and D. So from top left to bottom right, it's going to be the first value is A, next to it is B, drop down will be C, right in the right bottom corner is D. And if those are our four values in our contingency table, we add A and B and we take its factorial, C and plus C and D, it's factorial, and we add A and C and it's factorial, and B and D and it's factorial, and we divide that by A factorial times B factorial times C factorial times D factorial, and then N, all of them combined, that's the sample space, uh, the whole sample size, I should say, factorial. 
So let's do a little matrix and uh, we call it vowels and we're going to have two rows. So it's going to be two rows and two columns because I have four values there. And just to show you, I didn't uh, print out vowels to the screen here, but you can also add your row names and column names there. You don't have to do this at all. You only need the matrix. And we use fishes.test and we pass the two by two matrix to that, the contingency table, and we can see um, what it works out for us, what it works out for us there. So Fisher's test is very simple. So remember, we're going to use the chi-square goodness of a test for a single variable, chi-squared test of independence if we have two categorical variables, and then if we have very small numbers, very small sample sizes, we can use Fisher's exact test. Remember that for these tutorials on R, that the actual HTML rendered files are on R pubs, and uh, that's what you might see on the screen. But these files are also available in their raw form on GitHub. And all the links will be in the description below. So you can either go to the website and look at the RPUBs files as they're already rendered. Or you can go to GitHub and download those files into your system so that you can use them in R Studio yourself. So if you like these videos on R, please let me know so that I can make more of these or there's subjects that you want me to cover as far as biostatistics is concerned and the use of R, please let me know. Otherwise, please always remember to subscribe and hit the uh, notification bell so that when new videos come out, you will know about it. You can also follow me on Twitter because that's uh, where you'll also see uh, that new videos are out.